Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles, where today we have an interesting one for you. Uh, this, in the Pan American Tier 10 light cruiser, the San Martin, is Durek. He's a North American World of Warships streamer, although he's originally from Scotland. This wasn't actually sent in by Durek himself, this was sent in by one of his friends, and also a World of Warships streamer. Uh, stats bloke who was watching this stream at the time and said you know I think I know somebody who might like to see this replay and that's how I ended up with it if you're sufficiently impressed with what you see today and you'd like to see more then I'll put a link in the video description to Durax's twitch channel so what do we have today tier 10 domination battle on the warriors path map three cap circles alpha bravo and charlie uh, Durax has spawned just north of the Charlie Cap Circle. I say this is a Tier 10 battle, because, well, it's a Tier 10 battle, but there are some extremely nervous Tier 8s, and strangely enough, although Wargaming's matchmaker, so anything's possible, no Tier 9s. Also, no aircraft carriers. Good news. Two submarines per side. Not such good news, but better than having two or even one aircraft carrier. Also, both teams have radar. In fact, both teams have at least two radars. So, bad news for the destroyers. Uh, four destroyers per team. Quite a few cruisers, though. You can tell this is the North American server by the number of cruisers in play. Two battleships per side. Only one of which is a tier 10, though. Although... Oh, hello. I'm sorry. Was I in your way? <laughs> Whatever. Simple mistake. The ship that Durak is sailing, though, this is a relatively new one, the San Martin. I'm not entirely sure how you pronounce that. It's an Argentinian Navy ship, or it would have been if it had ever existed. Y you can tell it's Pan American by the sort of Aztec camo scheme that it has. Uh, the ship is a complete work of fiction. Oh, hang on a second. We'll talk about that shortly, right now. Somebody's detected. That looked like a very short duration radar. Which could mean that the Alexander Nevsky's over here, or it could be that he just sailed into radar range right at the end of its duration. What I do know for sure, however, is that he's spotted. And that's the guy spotting him, the enemy split. Tier 8 Pan-European destroyer. Now, we have ourselves a bit of a good news, bad news situation here. Durax divisioned up with the Daring over there, who naturally wants to take advantage of Durak's radar and kill that split as soon as he possibly can, but the split wasn't alone. There is also a Gearing who has just launched a whole bunch of torpedoes, spotted presumably by the Daring's Hydro. Elsewhere on the map, the enemy Kabarosk has just been sunk by the Smolensk, but the Daring over here is finding himself in a gunfight not just with one Tier 8 destroyer, which is what he originally thought, but also a tier 10 destroyer, an enemy submarine, and a German cruiser for the mines. And, uh, well, he takes the split out, but he doesn't survive the encounter. Finished off by the gearing. That gearing, by the way, is going to prove to be a consistent thorn in everybody's sides throughout the m remainder of this match. Credit where credit's due, he knew what he was doing, and he knew how to do it. Durak, noting the telltale oil slicks there, showing not just where the enemy submarine was, but which way it's going. Drops a few more depth charges. Already scored a couple of hits, not enough to save the uh, daring, of course. He's now being backed up by the Forest Sherman and switching his fire to the enemy mines. A couple of words about the San Martin. You might have known, and I'm apologizing if I'm mispronouncing that, by the way, Argentina. I see the way it's written, and I want to call it the San Martin, but that's more French than Spanish, so... <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, he's firing nothing but armor-piercing. That's because this ship can fire nothing but armor-piercing. Doesn't have high explosive, doesn't get semi-armor-piercing, armor-piercing is all it gets. But it does get armor-piercing with good penetration and improved penetration angles. Uh, and that mines is going nowhere. That's a good ship, but he's just getting melted. You can see the Forest Sherman is just pouring it on as well. And this is probably going to be Durak's first... Yep, there it is. There's his first kill. So, two or three enemy ships dealt with on this side of the map. That just leaves the gearing. 
However, my minor spoiler about how good that gearing is, as you can probably tell from the depth charges that are hammering the submarine up ahead, and have in fact sunk the submarine up ahead, all while the gearing was undetected, because, I mean, to be fair, diving deep works both ways. It renders you immune to detection by hydroacoustic search, but you also can't see the ships depth charging you. So, I mean, you know, there is some counterplay against submarines. It's not like they're aircraft carriers or anything. Elsewhere on the map, the slaughter continues. The team's Halland, their other tier 10 destroyer, along with the Boris Sherman here, just managed to take out the enemy Smolensk, a very, very valuable kill, but then died himself practically instantly at the hands of the enemy Richelieu. So that's one tier 8 enemy battleship who's going to be feeling very, very pleased with himself. That gearing, however, I mean, I've already kind of spoiled it for you by telling you that he's going to be a thorn in everybody's sides for the remainder of this match. There he is. Yeah, he's not hanging around waiting for a radar cruiser and a Forrest Sherman to catch him. But before he left, he dropped off a couple of surprises for the Forrest Sherman. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, that Forrest Sherman is now either going to be dead very, very soon or effectively more or less completely useless for the rest of the match by being extremely careful not to get spotted. He's now basically only good for uh, scouting. Uh, he instantly smokes up. I'm not sure why. I think that was probably just a panic reflex. Um, pretty sure he wasn't spotted by the gearing because there's no way the gearing is going to let himself get spotted when he knows there's a radar cruiser around. And you can see that Durak's RPF skill is pointing in the direction of where the gearing currently is. And it's nowhere near the Forest Sherman. He dumped those torpedoes and he scooted off as fast as he could. He's not interested in getting spotted. He's already left the area. He's not even spotting Durak. Although we might be spotting the Amagi and is possibly tempted to uh, try to get a torpedo kill on him. The Amagi's probably feeling pretty nervous by now. At least he knows that the uh, gearing has already launched his torpedoes. Much to the upset of the Forest Sherman. But while Durak is keeping an eye on the gearing's location and heading over to join the rest of his team, let's just have a quick chat about the ship that he's sailing. The Argentine light cruiser, the San Martin. Uh, a complete work of fiction. Oh, oh, the enemy druid, by the way, is also having a good game. He's just managed to kill the Smolensk. But yes, this ship is a complete work of fiction. Let me just read you the World of Warships wiki entry on this thing. Argentinian leaders planned on ordering the construction of new... Cru planned, right? Never actually did. Ordering the construction of new cruisers in the UK or the USA. The most suitable ships for these parameters at that time were cruisers of the Worcester class that designers would have been guided by if such ships had ever been ordered. One such ship could have been the San Martin. So basically they're just making shit up. This is a fictional design that might have happened if Argentina had decided to order construction of ships based on the design of a ship that was never constructed. So <laughs> it's a complete work of fiction. And that kind of worries me because it's not unheard of when Wargaming have license to just make shit up that they come up with some completely overpowered designs. Oh, hello. You see the torpedoes there going for the Amagi? You see, looking at those torpedoes and then looking at the RPF track pointing at where the gearing is, you can tell that the gearing is basically keeping track with these guys and just dumping torpedoes at them and hoping to score a hit. The Amagi, well, he didn't dodge anything. The torpedoes just missed which is fortunate because they were spotted way too late for the Yamagi to do anything about it if they had been on target. Anyway, quick chat about this ship, because it could have been overpowered, let's face it. Wargaming do do that when they have free license to just make up whatever shit they like, but not really in this case. It has what we like to call a funny button, a combat instruction, and what that does is every time you fire the guns, it charges up the combat instruction, and once it's fully charged, you can activate it and massively reduce the cooldown on your consumables, and this ship has a fair collection of consumables. It has a heal. It has a very, very good heal. It's almost British it's that good. It also has hydro, and it has radar. Oh, that Goliath's in a lot of trouble. Although he's got depth charges going out against the submarine, but I think it's the Montana that's probably going to be the big problem as Durak opens up on him with his armor-piercing shells, because that's the other thing about this ship. Oh, the Goliath's got the submarine. Good job. Um, this ship doesn't get high-explosive or semi-armor-piercing ammunition. It's armor-piercing only. But it does have 
very good penetration angles, although you don't need very good penetration angles when you're shooting at the broadside of a Montana like that. Oh, that Goliath's in a lot of trouble. Oh, he survived by the skin of his teeth. The Montana 16-inch guns can absolutely wreck him, but it's here where the Montana suffers from what I can only describe as a sudden and inexplicable rush of shit to the brain. He's got the Goliath, but then he turns the turrets around, eats Goliath torpedoes, stops shooting at the Goliath, swings his guns around this way, and rather than finishing off the Goliath, just kind of stops in the middle of the fight to start shooting at the Conqueror instead. <laughs> and, uh, and now, of course, low health battleship, everybody starts joining in the fun. The Goliath, Dirac here, the Conqueror, and the Amagi. So, yeah. I mean, wow. Oh, there goes the Nevsky. That's going to be a problem for the Goliath, but the Montana, not so much. The kills are now even again. Although, Durak's team are 200 points ahead, thanks to possession of two of the three cat circles. And that looks like... Is that the enemy Druid? It's a destroyer of some description. You'll note that the gearing is no longer the closest target. So what's he up to? Durak waiting until he gets close enough to make maximum effective use of his radar. And the Goliath has been taken down by the Nevsky. There goes the radar, it is the druid. He pops the heal. Note how much health that heal is capable of recovering. This is basically like the British super heal that you find on ships like the Nelson and the Conqueror. The timing of this was actually not that bad as Durak pushes forward in a very aggressive defense of the central cap circle at Bravo. Uh, he managed to do some damage to the druid. The gearing over there put a couple of shots in his direction, but that was well timed by the gearing. He managed to score some high explosive damage and then duck into cover behind the island without any fear of any kind of reprisal. The Des Moines, however, who is now radaring him, managed to get some 8-inch high explosive shells into him right before he passed into cover behind that island, which did set a fire. But it was only a single fire, no reason to burn the damage control. And pushing forward into island cover here has allowed him to get out of line of fire of all three of the enemy ships shooting at him, which is kind of important, well, except for the gearing, who's now managed to clear the island cover over there. But, well, this allows Jirak to shoot back. He's popped the Hydro, not because he's worried about torpedoes from the gearing, because the gearing isn't going to be able to launch torpedoes from there, and not because he's worried about torpedoes from the Druid, because the Druid doesn't have torpedoes, but he wants to know where the Druid's going and what he's doing. He's thinking about maybe chilling out here and just taken on the druid, but then he realises that the Des Moines has also suffered from a sudden and inexplicable rush of shit to the brain, and is giving him a perfect broadside to shoot at. I don't know what the Des Moines was thinking here, I mean, he knew that Durak was here, he's the one who radared him, but uh, never interrupt the enemy when they're making a mistake. Nails the Des Moines, and then the druid picks a remarkably brave fight here. <laughs> You know, you've got no torpedoes, right? And then he's dead too. Oh, he's given broadside to the Nevsky. I mean, at some point, you can, when you're in the middle of four enemy ships, it's impossible to angle against all four. At some point, you're going to be giving broadside to somebody. But, well, we saw in one of last week's videos just how dangerous the Alexander Nevsky is. Let's go and pick a fight with a gearing instead. I much prefer those odds. And there he is. Durak, last ship left alive on his team, by the way. Um, in all the excitement, it was easy to miss the rest of his team dying. Now, the gearing does definitely pose a substantial torpedo threat, and Hydro has just expired. But you cannot sit there waiting to get killed by the Nevsky. So he's nailed the gearing. He's going to take one torpedo. I mean, it was bloody obvious those torpedoes were coming. You didn't need to have Hydro up to know that they were on the way. But the manoeuvre getting in behind this island here, is now shielding him from fire from the Nevsky, which could easily kill him. That thing's guns are not funny. And now he can chill out and just wait for his heel to come off cooldown. You know what? Since we're here, we may as well flip this final cap circle. He's up to 850 points. And this is the only cap that the enemy have. In fact, he doesn't even have to take it. He just has to contest it. It's not like the Nevsky's going to be able to do anything about it. Well, he might. I mean, don't forget the Nevsky has radar. But it's not like the radar's going to help him. 
Durak's announcing where he is by sitting in this cap circle rather than running for the corner of the map and just running down the timer and winning on points. There's the radar, but like I said, it's fairly obvious where he was and he's parked behind an island. It's not clear whether or not the Nevsky... Oh, and the radar's expired anyway, so it didn't matter whether or not the Nevsky actually had a firing solution. <laughs> you can't see him now. And of course, Durak has radar of his own, and he also has the RPF skill, so he always knows exactly in which direction the Nevsky's coming from. And let's face it, with time against him, the Nevsky is probably not trying to do anything subtle, and is probably just heading straight here. And according to the RPF position pointer, yep, there he is, that's exactly what he's doing. How many times have you seen people in this situation, usually happens in every episode of A Game of Throws, where instead of just taking the win, you know, when you're 400 points ahead and you're about to win on points, the last surviving ship on the enemy team chooses violence <laughs> and comes out and fights. Yeah, not Durak. He has all three of the cap circles. He's almost at a thousand points. He just farms a little bit of cheeky damage there on the Nevsky, thanks to saving his radar until he needed it the most. And then with a completely respectable 138,000 damage, five kills in the Kraken Unleashed, doesn't risk getting himself killed, is quite happy to take an extremely comfortable win there by reaching a thousand points, much to the frustration of the Alexander Nevsky and earning himself a solo warrior into the bargain, along with all of his other rewards, making it look really, really easy in the process. Unsurprisingly, Nearly 3,000 base experience there. Way ahead of the rest of his team on experience earned. Commiserations, of course, to the Gearing, who earned more base experience on a defeat than all but the top two scoring members, uh, Durak himself and the Goliath, on the winning team. That's really got to suck. I have to admit, it is nice to see a destroyer captain who knows what they're doing. Fortunately, the enemy team only had one of them, so... <laughs> Although the enemy druid had a fairly good game as well. But uh, yeah, Durak in the Argentine Tier 10 cruiser, the San Martin, it's a pretty decent ship. Complete work of fiction, of course, and I do tend to get worried when wargaming give themselves free license to just start making shit up, because they tend to produce stuff that's more than a little bit overpowered, but not in this case. I think this is a fairly well-rounded ship. Um, it has certain strengths, it has certain weaknesses, and that's exactly the way it should be. And Durak here... Uh, Played it to perfection. Cool, calm, collected. Never let himself get panicked or flustered. Did exactly what he needed to do when he needed to do it. And if you like what you saw and you want to see more in the future, there's a link in the video description to his Twitch channel. Take care, folks, and I'll catch you next time.